We can do it. Yes, we can. We can change things throughout the land. But we all must lend a hand. We can do it. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, your neighbor over there, a bit bewildered, but he cares. He just doesn't know what to do. Join together. Hi, welcome to Changing Our World. I'm Linda Weltner, your host. And this morning we're going to be talking about a woman who chose to go to prison, not because she committed a crime, but because she came to the conclusion, her name is Jean Traunstein, and she's been teaching Shakespeare to women in prison. She's going to be speaking this afternoon at the Abbott Library, we're going to hear a little bit of that lecture. But um, Jean, I didn't get that much out of Shakespeare, and I took it at Wellesley. <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you get these women who probably have very little education, correct? Some of them just mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. How do you get them involved? When I first started teaching in prison, I was teaching for the community college. I was teaching just regular writing classes, literature classes, and so on. For Middlesex. Um, well, at the time it was Middlesex. Also, was not what choose. Different colleges had contracts, but um, and I was a high school teacher full-time uh -huh. high school teacher at Duxbury, Massachusetts, where I worked with very kind of privileged kids. So I thought going into prison would be a lark and a little different. Um, and I hadn't done it, and so I was excited to do it. But one of the women in my one of my classes, well, the class I was teaching at the time, which was a writing class, said, we need to do a play. The men do plays. This was in 1987. Uh -huh. The men do plays, and they. She had seen Man of La Mancha, which toured, in, at the time. With prisoners. Yeah, it, it is a different time, a different right. kind of feeling in the country, and uh, there was much more support for social programs. Anyway, so she said we have to do a play. So I thought. I don't know, that seems like a lot of work. My background is in theater, but a play in prison, I didn't know, da da da. So I applied for a grant from the Massachusetts Foundation for Humanities, and as I said, I was teaching high school, I thought it would be kind of interesting to do the same play in high school that I would do at the same time. So it you'd prison. have like, it would almost be like a laboratory. Yeah, an experiment yes. to see which, how the kids reacted, did they respond differently. And a part of my notion was, I mean, I came up with that because I, I had gotten a grant to study Shakespeare in England that summer. And so that was sort of part of my way of thinking it would be great to go and I could learn about, you know, more about Shakespeare. I did love Shakespeare, not as much as... I do now, but I, I thought Shakespeare was, but, but let me just finish answering your question. So it was really the notion that for the women, it would be the hardest thing they could possibly do, and therefore would give them the most bang for the buck. They would feel the most successful about themselves if they could do it. But wouldn't they also feel the more apprehensive? Well, I didn't really, I wasn't afraid of that. I knew the women and I thought we would make this work and in fact they taught me the method which I ended up using which was adaptation of text. They taught me, we paraphrased it, oh, we put okay. it into their own words, we used improv and so the actual work of understanding Shakespeare became much easier. Right. And you didn't do that with your high school students? Um, yeah, to some degree, but the high school students were much more interested in the romance in Merchant of Venice. The women were interested in the trial scene. Oh, all right. So did you perform it for both, an audience? In both places, yeah. In the, in the high school, we performed the, the, one of the scenes for the high school and in the prison. Yeah, and I actually directed eight plays in prison since, I mean, that was a total of eight plays since I first directed Merchant of Venice and performed it for 200 women in the prison. And did you think the women in prison got as much out of it as the high school students? Oh, sure. Absolutely. In, in what way? What, what relation? What could Merchant of Venice say to a group of women in prison? Well, 
Shakespeare's stories are very universal. They speak to people. They, it's, it's, even though you had difficulty with the language, it's not the language that makes Shakespeare, in my opinion. It's the stories that make Shakespeare. The stories are incredible. They're universal. They, they speak of, I mean, the, the trial scene in Merchant of Venice, here you have a situation where someone has, a ba his daughter has abandoned him, he has made he he has made a bet with um, not he hasn't made a bet but someone else has made a bet to get his ships at sea if his ship ships are at sea they'll make money kind of like the stock yeah. market the way I explained it to the women to see if they'll make money and he loses this bet and then Shylock who is an outsider a Jew in a Christian world very similar to the women being outsiders that he would then demand his pound of flesh, and thus this amazing situation occurs where Portia comes in to help solve this problem. And the women, we decided to do it where they, we had Portia be um, undisguised. Oh, okay. As opposed to disguised. Yeah. And they totally identified with the, the text. And it was a great um, experience for them. You know, that word a pound of flesh has gone into our language and means a real sacrifice. And when you think of it, women, particularly married women with children, the system takes a pound of flesh because it tears them away from their flesh and blood. Mm. So that must have, the whole criminal mm. system thing must have seemed very meaningful. Yeah, I think what, what happened, what, we had stacked the deck so much against Shylock. The person who chose to play sex, Shylock, had HIV. And so she was an outsider in a world of outsiders, right. which was even at the time, I guess was 1988 we put the play on, um, that was my first play. She was um, amazingly connected to this character. But the, um, the point is that when we put it on, the women in the audience, when it gets to this point in the play where um, Antonio says, you know, because you've asked for a man's flesh, because you've demanded flesh, um, what we're going to do is make you, uh, we're going to take away your religion, <coughs> which is part of Shakespeare's, what is in Shakespeare's text. What happened is the audience yelled out, you cannot take away a man's faith. There's nothing wrong with being a Jew if that's what you are. And things like that. Oh. And it was really profound. Let me just show a copy of your book, Shakespeare Behind Bars, and if you're interested, after you hear Jean speaking, uh, she's going to talk a little bit about the impact that this had on the women themselves. Mm -hmm. How would it change you to go from being a pretty much powerless mm -hmm. Uh, inmate of a prison to actually wielding emotional power mm. and uh, exploring your emotions and your feelings in a group, uh, I would think it would make quite a difference. So we're going to get to hear part of your lecture. In 1986, I was a high school teacher at Duxbury, Duxbury Massachusetts at a privileged school and I had kids who were you know, just your regular high school kids, maybe they would be like Marblehead kids. I, I don't know, except that I do know that at the time I got a, a paper from one who said, the first time I saw a black person was, <laughs> and they were protected, they were privileged, and they had certain views of the world. At the same time, a friend of mine offered me the opportunity to teach a college-level class in a prison, Framingham prison. And, and I thought, well, wow, this is a step up. I'm a high school teacher. I'll be teaching a college class in a prison. I knew nothing about prisoners. I knew nothing about the criminal justice system. I just thought it would be an interesting thing to do. I had no clue, none. But I'm a little bit of an adventurer, so I decided to try it. The only training I got to teach in prison was about two hours a guard, a guard sort of lecture telling me um, to basically not take bribes. 
be careful. Don't take bribes. That was it. And, um, okay, so the first night, and this is when prison was a little bit different in these days. This was before high-tech scanners. This was before things were such that you could just sort of walk in in an in a efficient way. This was the Pat Search, the days of the Pat Search. So I got to Framingham, and I knew nothing. I, had, I was preparing a little bit of a class, and I was going to teach an English class. It was an English class I was teaching. And um, I was excited. I was going to start with poetry. We'd have fun. And I got there, and I was so shocked. They, it was a pat search up and down. It was my legs. I had long hair at the time. It was going through my hair, my mouth open, looking in my ears. And I couldn't believe it. And I said, if I feel this violated, what do those people inside feel like? And that was the first moment, I would say, of my political awareness about people inside prison. So the first night I got in, and it was program room two, that's what they called it. And it was one of those rooms where there was a piece of cord stuck in the wall, connected to a TV frayed, and there was a window kind of half, a little bit open that they could, you couldn't close with bars on the window, and a light kind of hanging down from the ceiling, and really sparse, and a table that had one leg a little bit limpy. And I sat there waiting for the women to come, and there was what they call movement, and I didn't know about any of this. So the women arrived. And I'm going to give you a little portrait of the women from my first class. First one, Dolly. And Dolly was a grandmother. And I thought, a grandmother in prison? That just blew my mind. She would bring her knitting to class. This was the gal before days where you couldn't take your knitting needle. She, <laughs> she brought her knitting. She had kind of a bouffant hairdo. She reminded me of somebody out of Bonnie and Clyde, but older. And she was very Boston. She had a Boston accent, grew up in Chelsea. Um, and I didn't know anything about her story. Eventually, I began to find out. Because I, I, you don't ask what anybody's crime is when you're teaching. You just teach, just like you teach a regular class. I never asked my students, what did you do before you got there? I don't really want to know. But <laughs> same, the same thing in prison. You don't ask. So, but Dolly would write. She would write things. She wrote poems. She wrote all sorts of things about her family. And one day she came to class with this nine-page letter that she was writing to the superintendent about her case. And that's how I learned that she had been, a, what happened to her is she was um, in Chelsea, living in her apartment complex. And her son was always having conflict with somebody in the complex. And the man she was living with at the time, they weren't married, but he was, she later realized, somewhat abusive. She didn't know this, really, that that was what the word was, abuse. But he was intimidating to her. You know, he said, you know, don't worry, we're going to take care of this, we take care of this ourselves, that kind of thing. So one day, the son got into a fight with this guy. The boyfriend got furious. He stormed down out of the apartment, and he stabbed the guy that was hurting him you know, that it hurt her son. Dolly tried to call, this is her story, of course, how do you know exactly what's true? He tried to, she tried to call the police. He told her, you do not do that. He, he threw down the phone. Of course, people saw her going up and people saw her going down. He was arrested. The person who he stabbed died nine months later. And at that point, they were both arrested and accused of Second, well, I think it was, it was uh, first degree murder, I think they were accused of. She was given joint venture, meaning that she had an equal part in the crime and would be tried also for the crime, even though it was his hand mm -hmm. and he had been the one who mm -hmm. committed the murder. So she was poor, couldn't get a lawyer. Uh, as I always like to say, she had a lousy lawyer. Um, and she ended up getting second degree life eligibility to see parole after 15 years. Wow. Same sentence he got. 
So that's what I read in her letter. I had no idea what was true. I had no idea what wasn't true. But she was there, and she ended up serving 15 years. That was the first person in my class doll. The second was Bertie. Bertie was Jamaican, beautiful, 20-ish, absolutely one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen inside or outside prison. She, um, I didn't know why she was in prison. I didn't know for a long time. She, she, she came to class at first and she said she was very sassy. And in these days you could wear your own clothes. She used to wear like dashikis. She would have earrings. She would bring a little pink radio to class. And she was, you know, a character. And she said to me, you know, putting her hands on her hips, something like, it's ESL or you, you know, but she said it with a Jamaican accent. That's why I'm here. So, you know, don't think too much of it. So that's how she arrived. A few months after I was, I got to know Bertie, she wrote, again, a piece for the class. And this was a story that she wrote where she had, um, she told about her life growing up in Jamaica and how she loved the rural countryside and her family and they had goats and they raised goats and she loved, she had a special particular goat who was her friend and she loved this goat so much she got her mother to for her to take the goat to school and talk about the goat that night she got home she was so happy her mother had a party for some reason and Bertie had a weird feeling she went outside and she found her goat's head in a pot. Um. Her mother had killed the goat and served it at the party for dinner. Um. So this to me was Greek. This was this was Shakespearean. This was larger than life. This was not something I knew from my Cincinnati background where I was normal and had, you know, played on the street with kids and kickball and you know, had a regular life. I didn't understand that. All of a sudden, I found myself, wait a minute, why is this happening? Why is, why did this happen to her? And why am I here? And all these things began inside my head. And then I found out that Bertie was in prison because she had killed her daughter, uh, her baby. Uh. By this time, I loved Bertie. Many people have asked me, how could you stand this? How could you be in a class with someone who killed her child? I learned from her, like I learned from Dolly, that, you know, poverty makes such a difference to whether you're in prison or not. From Bertie, I learned that it's not the person that is necessarily bad. It's the crime. And I learned that there was probably maybe a difference between the person and the crime, and that there were some reasons for a crime. It was the beginning of my understanding about that. That was number two. Third person was Kit. Now, Kit was the person you would not want into class. Mm -hmm. Kit was, she had a voice like this. She was smoking all the time. Again, you could smoke in prison at these days. The women would go over in the middle of the class. They would smoke out that little open part of the window. And, um, you know, it was the thing that helped them through some, you know, many of them had drug problems. 80% of women, by the way, about 80% of women in prison are mothers. So it's really hard to do time. So a lot of them smoked, a lot of them handled their anxiety that way. Kit was, um, Kit also grew up in Chelsea. It was really, it was a, was a, she just seemed nasty to me. I didn't like her. I didn't want to not like her, but I didn't like her. And then I found out, you know, she came to class with a piece of writing about how she had no money and how her daughter had been taken away from her when she got to prison because there was no mother, there was no husband, there was no sister, there was no one who would take her child. And so the child, of course, went into the Department of Social Services. And she <coughs> wrote about how when she was out of prison, she used to take her daughter around and they would look in the windows of shops and they would think about owning the dresses in the windows. Mm -hmm. And again, another side, mm -hmm. another side to a person. Fourth person, Rhonda. Rhonda was college educated. She had, in fact, done, she had done a lot of college. 
she probably would have been really successful, except that her father died when she was young. She got into drugs. Kit had a drug habit. Dolly had no drugs. Bertie had no drugs. But um, Rhonda got into drugs, and she got arrested. Something to do with drugs, embezzlement. She worked for a bank. You know. But she was a high-class prisoner. Uh, she was beautiful, also smart. And she came to class because it gave, she said it connected her to her roots, her educational roots. I think she grew up in Milton. Um, she had gone to private school. She was African-American, but a very sort of unique, educated person for that day. To grow up in Milton as a black woman, I think, was probably more difficult than today. So she was interesting. And, um, she turns out that she had, her mother was a, a reverend, which I didn't know. And Rhonda, also I didn't know, who wanted to be a lawyer. She was in class because it made her feel who she really was, the smart person that she had been before she got into crime. The fifth person is Rose. Rose had HIV. And in 1986, it was 1987, pretty awful to have HIV, and particularly awful to have HIV in a prison. Um, people were wearing gloves everywhere. Um, nobody wanted to be with you when you were in a dorm. Rose did have people she roomed with, but people didn't want to be near her. She worked in the kitchen. They didn't want her working in the kitchen. All sorts of fear about HIV. So Rose came because she felt included in our class, where she felt not included in prison. So this was my motley crew when I began teaching. And all of a sudden, after several semesters, we did actually two semesters, we did writing, and then I started teaching um, some literature. Dolly said, we have to do a play. I have to do a play. The men do plays. So I said, OK, I'll think about it. Now I have a theater background. But the idea of doing a play in prison, I mean, you can't turn off lights. What are you going to do for costumes? What are you going to do for a set? How, who's the audience? How are you going to get people? What about rehearsals? What if somebody's locked? How are they going to come to rehearsals? Someone has a dentist appointment. They go to the, the only time they can go to the dentist is once a year, maybe. So they're not going to come to your rehearsal when they have a dentist appointment, etc., etc. I would apply for a grant to go study Shakespeare in England. And I saw Merchant of Venice. I'd never seen it before. The realization that this play dealt with women's issues and it dealt with justice was really compelling to me. They actually helped me develop my method, which became what I did the rest of my plays. I did actually eight plays in the prison. This was my first. It was they, the women, that taught me to do this. And what they did was say, we have to make this meaningful. We have to make this meaningful to us. We don't want to be idiots. The hardest audience of any audience would be their fellow, fellow prisoners. So how you have to help. My belief about Shakespeare is that the language is not, it's not just the language, although I know people argue this with me. It's the story. It's these amazing stories that are so universal. You know, Dolly becomes Antonio because Dolly's the Don G in the prison. You know, Bertie can't speak English that well at this time. Five plays later, she was great, but she was, you know, so she's got a small part. And <coughs> Portia, of course, is Rhonda, who wanted to be a lawyer and is going to be a lawyer in the play. Rose, of course, is Shylock, because Shylock is the outsider. Which one is you? Shylock! Yes, how are you? You see the lady? Get it Oh, you must be Shylock. Uh, Shylock is my name. Oh, I see. Well, you understand that your request is plain and is quite unusual. But New York law does permit you to proceed with these uh, injunctions. Uh, you are in debt to him, are you not? Huh, so he tells me. Uh, let's see. I understand there's something about a contract that you willingly and in full knowledge signed a contract indicating that if you forfeited, you would give a pound of I admit to that. Why would you admit to something like that? I mean, why would you agree to such terms? This is, that's barbaric. This is a 20, a pound of flesh. He can hold you to that. 
My friend Bassanio was in trouble. Financially, he needed a great deal of money. I signed a contract. Including the stipulation of flesh. I would die for my friend. Then the Jew must be merciful. Must be merciful? And why must I? The quality of mercy is not strain. It dropped from heaven like the gentle rain onto the earth below. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that receives. It is mightiest in the mightiest and becomes better to the throne monarch than the crown itself. His scepter is evident of the awe and the majesty that causes men to kneel before kings, but mercy is above the scepter. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings, and it is its characteristic of God himself. Earthly power is closest to God's when mercy seasons justice. Were we to answer to justice alone, none of us would see heaven because we are all sinners. When we pray, we pray for mercy. That same prayer teaches us to have mercy for others. I have said all of this to try and persuade you to drop this case. If you continue with this, you're asking for that man's life. My religion will take care of my sinners. Yeah, I demand justice. The penalty for causing a contract. Isn't he able to pay the money? Of course he can pay the law. I've got twice the rigor law. I've gotten on my boat paid ten times that. I've sacrificed my own flesh and blood. If that's not enough, then I don't feel that hate is stronger than truth. Well, the, the fact of somebody being exposed to something like this is almost more than you can ever imagine. So to ask, you know, what's their recidivism rate is sort of the wrong question. The question is, what will happen for the rest of their lives? What will they do? Will they read to their children? Will they understand more about literature? Will they feel better about themselves? Will they... Etc. I continued to do plays for many years, um, and then I got into Changing Lives for Literature, which I continue to do, where people are on probation rather than in prison. So this is the work that I did. There are many other people now around the country that do this work. You've heard probably of the famous video, Shakespeare Behind Bars, that was done. Another person happened to have the same title as me, and he and I are friends. He's done work with men. But at the time that I started this, there was really, really, there was really no one uh, that I could talk to in this country. And now there are a lot of people. So, well, thank you. I want to say okay. thank you. Because an idea, this time has come, cannot be stopped by anyone. Plant your seeds in fertile ground. There ain't nothing going to keep it down.